Welcome everyone to the Stateless Atheist. Today, I am summarizing Georgetown Law Professor John Hasness' article, The Myth of the Rule of Law. As I do in these videos, the first part will be a summary of the article, then after, I will give my thoughts. I do it this way, so not to confuse what are my thoughts and which are the authors. Remember, this is a summary, so I will be discussing the pieces that I think are most relevant if you want to read the full article, I will link it in the description. Well, let's begin. There are very few things more sacrosanct than the idea of the rule of law within classical liberal philosophy. According to the rule of law, laws are objective and not bound by human subjectivity. Proponents of the idea often say, we have a government of laws, not of people. The idea behind it, while good in theory, is untenable, according to John Hasness. He begins by explaining the public's beliefs about the legal system when Robert Bork and Clarence Thomas were nominated to the Supreme Court. There was immense public political battles. Often when a new judgment comes out, either from the left or the right, the other side will condemn the decision saying that was undemocratic judicial activism or unprincipled social engineering. Hasness believes this is the public engaging in doublethink. They simultaneously believe that law is inherently political in nature, yet it is also an objective embodiment of justice. Hasness states plainly at the beginning that a society governed by neutral laws that are objectively applied by judges is impossible. He further states that the idea is both powerful and dangerous. It makes people think of a fair and equitable system and is used to command the allegiance of the country's citizenry. I mean, who wouldn't favor the rule of law if their only other option would be arbitrary commands dictated by man? This, however, is the danger of the idea, as it creates a belief that they are being governed fairly. He establishes in the article three points. One, there is no such thing as a government of law and not of people. Two, the belief that there is serves to maintain public support for society's power structure. And three, the establishment of a truly free society requires abandonment of the myth of the rule of law. When confirming facts using the empirical method, it is reasonable to assume that contradictory facts are false. This is because the laws of nature are consistent. However, it doesn't work this way for the legal world. Man-made laws are not consistent. Contradictory views within law can both ha be proven correct. Hasness calls this the fallacy of legal reasoning. He gives a, an example of two law students in a class together working on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The professor asked them if the, if the statute to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge an individual or otherwise discriminate against an, any individual with respect to his com compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals' race, color, religion, sex, or national origin permits an employer to voluntarily institute an affirmative action program given preferential treatment to African Americans. Arnie, a conservative, believes that affirmative action clearly breaks that principle and finds that statutory principle that states, when the words are plain, courts may not enter speculative fields in search of a different meaning, and the language must be regarded as the final expression a legislative intent and not added to or subtracted from the basis of any extraneous source. He believes that the wording here cannot be any more plain, so he feels he has determined the correct decision. Not surprisingly, Anne, a liberal, believes that affirmative action is a moral necessity. She learns of a principle that states it is a familiar rule that a thing may be within the letter of a statute and you not yet not within the statute because not within its spirit nor within the intentions of its makers. 
and that an interpretation which would bring about an end at variance with the pro purpose of the statute must be rejected. She also learns the initial intent of the section of the Civil Rights Act was to relieve the plight of the Negro in our economy. As a result, she believes that it would be against the original intent of the Civil, Civil Rights Act if affirmative action programs were not legal. When they present their cases, they are both commended for giving good arguments, and neither are told they are wrong. How could this be? How could they both be correct when their arguments are contradictory? It is because the normative presupp predispositions of the decision makers, rather than the law itself, that determines the outcomes of cases. The law is inherently political. If this is true, does it have to be this way? Maybe it is because the law as it currently written is too vague or contains too many contradictions. Of course, it is probably because of the liberal activist judges or the evil Republican right. Is that correct? All we need to do is create a legal system that is consistent, clear, and definitive, right? No, argues Hasness, that is impossible. Why? Because there's no such thing as uninterpretable language. Despite it being indefinite, it isn't because of some conspiracy either. It needs to be that way. As the law in the United States at the federal level applies to over 300 million people in an infinite number of interactions. The law has a tension between order and justice. Since every case is different, if the law is definitive, justice for the individual would be impossible. Many people hearing this may argue if this were true, then how come there is a stability within the system? Why, if, the if this is true, do judges quite often have similar decisions? This stability has nothing to do with the feature of the law, but due to common traits of those in power to make legal decisions. They are generally from solid, middle to upper class households. They went to the same prestigious schools with the same professors. They all did well on the standardized law school admissions test and built their careers at prestigious law firms, often on Wall Street. Furthermore, to be appointed to a bench, they must almost be exclusively a moderate in the political spectrum and until recently, <coughs> a white male with the correct ethnic and religious background. Given all of this, it is not surprising that there will be a high degree of agreement among them. However, the stability of law is not completely true either. Law is constantly changing, slowly, but still evolving with society. This is because each generation of judges is slightly different than their previous generation. This can be seen in the changing views within law on separate but equal, gay marriage, abortion, and many other cases. This understanding of law has been known since at least the late 19th century then why do so many people still believe that law is an objective discipline? Hasness argues that the more people are willing to accept the view of deterministic rules, the more willing they are to support the exercise of power over them. Which would you prefer? Rules governing that, you are, that are objective or rules that change based on the state official you are dealing with? Divine right was the early form of this, as the king was said to be an integral part of God's plan making his rule determinate and not subjective. Unfortunately, divine right became discredited and they needed another idea to bind political authority and the idea was the rule of law. The rule of law does more than just make people submissive to the state. It also turns them into the state's partners in crime. People who would normally be against depriving others of their rights would do so unwaveringly at the behest of the state. The myth of the impersonal government is simply the most effective tool of social control available to the state. So, what is the solution? Hasness calls for a free market of law. But most people think this would result in gang warfare. Why? According to Hasness, the primary reason is we are indoctrinated to believe law and order are inseparable. Order, as he defines it, is what people need to live together in peace and security. 
Law, on the other hand, is just one method for achieving that order, an order achieved by central planning. Hasnes goes on to give examples of what a free market of law would look like. In labor disputes, there are collective bargaining agreements. In Homer Homer agreements, create the rules and dispute mechanisms within housing communities. Universities create the rules for both the students and faculty that cover everything that happens on campus. The final example he gives is of all the disputes that are settled in arbitration instead of going through the government legal system. According to recent experiments with negotiated dispute settlement, it has been shown that mediation produces a higher level of participation, satisfaction with regards to both process and result, resolves cases more quickly and at a significantly lower cost, and results in a higher rate of voluntary compliance with the final decree than if the case was decided by traditional litigation. Hassan says this is unsurprising as it removes the winner-takes-all mentality and creates a sense of seeking common ground. This is much closer to ancient systems of law than what exists today. This article was one of the first articles I read after becoming an anarchist. It is, in my opinion, quite simple yet profound at the same time. Where should I begin with my analysis? One thing that made me think Hassan's early in the essay says there is no conspiracy to create an indeterminate law, that law is naturally subjective, and then later in the essay seems to imply that there is a conspiracy to get people to believe that there is an objective law. This seems to be a little contradictory. Yes, it is possible to have a thing be natural, but then a conspiracy to hide it. That is, sadly, what many flat earthers believe, that the earth is flat and it is a conspiracy to hide that because somehow a round earth gets rid of God. But I think in Hasnes, the situation is a little deeper than that. It may be that there is no grand conspiracy of people sitting around a table wondering how to enslave the masses. They may themselves often believe that the idea of the rule of law is true. I know in my graduate studies, we discuss the rule of law quite often, as there are many academic articles articles discussing the rule of law. It is often assumed to be one of the necessary requirements for good institutional structure and growth. This is especially common in the development literature. Never did we ever entertain this idea that the rule of law is a myth. If I went and told one of my professors this, they would have, they would have balked at the idea. Sure, it is possible that they do not know, but the politicians who create the laws know or that the professors just hide it really well. While those are possible, I think they are highly improbable. Politicians receive the same education. At what point do they learn this? When they get elected, does someone walk up to them and whisper in their ear something akin to Hail Hydra? And wouldn't it be quite hard for every professor to hide this fact? Furthermore, if there was this great conspiracy to hide it, wouldn't they try to silence Hasnes for letting the secret out. It is, in my opinion, that they don't consider it nor teach it because they do not believe it. They think it is ridiculous and while we want academic professors to be less biased, are they really? Now I'm not saying that there are no professors that are less biased, but there are many Marxists that would not dare look at classical liter liberal literature except to debunk it. The same is true of classical liberal professors. Why should we believe that professors, being human, have different motivations or biases than non-academics? A great insight of public choice theory is that human nature is the same both in and out of government. The same is true of academia, as they are fallible humans just like the rest of us. But Hasnes calls it indoctrination to raise people believing this. Even if there is no conspiracy, but they teach it to us without question, I would still call that indoctrination. Another thing I would like to bring up is you see the theme here, which is similar to what I say in my other videos, that ideas have power. Without the idea of a legitimate state or the rule of law that supports that idea, people would not be willing to go along with much of what the state says. As 
Etienne de la Beauté says in The Politics of Obedience, Discourse on Voluntary Servitude, I serve, I should like merely to understand how it happens that so many men, so many villages, so many cities, so many nations, sometimes suffer under a single tyrant who has no other power than the power they give him, who is able to harm them only to the extent to which they have the willingness to bear with him, who could do them absolutely no injury unless they preferred to put up with him rather than contradict him. Surely a striking situation. Yet it is so common that one must grieve the more and wonder the less at the spectacle of a million men serving in wretchedness. Their necks under the yoke, not constrained by a greater multitude than they. In other words, the state gets power from the masses believing that it is legitimate. If we all understood this, it would quickly lose its power over the people. Now, if people are all that is necessary for the state to behave, to have power, why couldn't ideas themselves be the cause of order? Finally, I would like to add to the argument of the indeterminate nature of language. How often do you get into an argument with someone online over the meaning of a word? Remember, dictionaries are descriptive, not prescriptive. This means they are describing how people use words, not telling you how you must use words. There is no word czar forcing everyone to adhere to the same definition. Definitions are always changing how they are used, and they are even have different meanings in different contexts. I would like to leave it there. Leave your answers to any questions in the comments, or if you would like to talk about anything else within this article. I am a new channel, and if you find value in my work, please subscribe and share it with your friends. I hope to continue to improve the quality of the channel and want more interaction with my viewers. Thank you, and see you soon. Thank you everyone for joining me. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you soon.